record on the show. So the Zoom is being recorded now. And I record my audio separately. So I'm going to start recording in three, two, one. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sandy K Nutrition Health and Lifestyle Queen. Today with me, I welcome back Dr. Bill Lawrence. We had Dr. Bill on, I'm calling you Dr. Bill. We had you on the show um, a while back and you talked to us all about this fabulous study on telomeres that you are actually conducting. So you're conducting two clinical studies. And today we're going to talk a little bit more about the DNA methylation study, which is another study of aging. And I'm going to, for those of you who haven't um, watched the first one yet, I just want to make sure that I introduce Dr. Lawrence properly. He actually has a law degree. He has a master of science in psychology and a PhD in nutrition. Since 1990, his focus has been on slowing and reversing human biological aging. He's developed numerous science-based protocols focused on optimal aging for health professionals and individual clients. And presently, he is the administrator of these two clinical studies, one of which we're going to discuss today. So welcome back, Dr. Lawrence. Andy, it's a pleasure to be here. Actually, as I always say, it's a pleasure to be any place. <laughs> of course, of course. Don't we all feel this way this, these days? Yes. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get back into this topic because it's definitely near and dear to my own heart. I am 51. I'm not quite there yet, but I definitely want to be there where I am in my 70s and ballroom dancing like yourself and your partner, right? Absolutely. We were out Friday, Saturday and Sunday night. That's amazing. You see, this is this is the kind of thing that I believe, you know, anybody who really cares. There's listen, there's going to be people who don't care. That's just a fact. Some people just don't care and they just leave it to destiny, whatever maybe, but I'm personally not one of them. And I know a lot of people in my community are not those type of people either. So very interested in this type of information. So, you know, maybe we can start, uh, I know that you brought your presentation with us and maybe we can start at the beginning, like we did last time for those of the, those of you who have seen the first video, I would suggest that you go back and watch because Dr. Lawrence gets into great detail about the telomerase activation study first. And today it's going to be more of a review of that. And then we're going to get into the meat of the DNA methylation study, which is really part two of what Dr. Lawrence does. So if you'd like to take the stage, I would love that. Okay, Sandy, uh, ju just uh, context here for a second. Um, yeah. I have been invested, heavily invested in health and longevity for a long time, uh, more than three decades. And as I mentioned in the other uh, podcast and YouTube, uh, we don't have longevity uh, in the male side of my family line. Everybody dies in their 50s and 60s, including mm -hmm. my father. Uh, and that's what caused me to change careers and focus the last 30 years. Um, and I didn't mention it before, and I oftentimes don't mention it, but um, I'm going to be 75 in a couple of months. I have 10 siblings, a large Mormon family, and already uh, three of those siblings have died. Uh, two of them, when they reached 61, uh, another one when she was 63, and then just a few months ago, a uh, niece of one of the deceased died at age 40. Oh, so yeah. what drives me is um, the, the issue in our family, of course, you know, we don't have longevity. And I guess the other thing that drives me is just I love waking up to another day of whatever this life is going to be on out there. It's like the most amazing adventure for me. And, you know, even the tough days, you know, at, I can't say that in the moment of that tough day, I'm thinking, what a wonderful adventure. But when I look back at it later, having survived whatever that was, you know, even, even the misadventures, uh, just to have 
have life another day, another month, another year um, is what drives me. And a lot of my research is about what the really what the maximum lifespan of humans can be. Mm-hmm. And I've, I slipped in a slide towards the end. Uh, there's a new study that came out that's basically suggesting uh, 150 is within our grasp. Wow. Yeah. And that's healthfully, right? That's yes. Healthfully. Oh, yes. Not yes, just yes. lifespan, but health span. Yes, absolutely. So uh, with all that, I can uh, go through a quick review of uh, sort of the the studies in terms of who's involved in these studies. And then we'll talk about peptides quickly. And then we'll talk about, uh, we'll we'll get down to the DNA methylation. So there are two clinical studies um, and there's actually sort of two and a half, but there's, we'll say there's two clinical studies. Uh, the first one, as Sandy, you've spoken about the telomere study, is what I call a confirmation study. The, the Russians already figured out that they could use peptides. Uh, they figured this out in the 90s, that they could use peptides to activate the telomerous enzyme. And that telomerous enzyme then allows us to replace or regrow or lengthen the little end caps uh, on the end of our chromosomes. And I, I won't spend a lot of time with it because people can look at the, uh, the first video. But why that's important is that cell replication takes place um, as a result of our chromosomes splitting, forming, and so forth. And when those chromosomes split, they have to have an end cap to protect the integrity of the chromosome in order for the cell to actually duplicate or replicate itself perfectly. And each time the uh, cells replicate, you lose a little bit of that end cap as we talked about, okay? So if you have something that can regrow those telomere end caps, then you get more cell replication. And I'll kind of leave it at there and let people take a look at the first video. I do have one question. How, mm-hmm. how many times in a lifetime do those cells replicate typically? About, according to Leonard, um, well, according to several scientists, um, about 50 to 60 times, okay? Oh, okay. Um, the, it's, there's a, Leonard Hayflick at the UC San Francisco back in the 60s um, did a long study and finally figured out that about 50 to 60 replications is what you can get for a human being. It's called the Hayflick limit, very famous. Yes, I've heard of that. Yes. Um, the Russians were able to exceed that the Russian scientists were able to exceed that by 42%. Wow, that's huge. Yes, and the published paper, I sent the published paper to uh, Dr. Hayflick about three years ago, uh, but haven't heard back from him. Hmm. Anyway, so let's go through some of the background here. Um, This is me pulling that, uh, the clock of time back, or at least attempting to do so uh, with these two studies. Uh, As we talked about before, this is people's accepted paradigm for aging. This is what everybody expects, okay? Not a very pretty picture, but that is what people expect. And at the moment, that more or less reality for most of us, okay? There are lots of different theories of aging, more than shown on this slide. Uh, There's probably twice as many, maybe three times as as many uh, different theories of, but the, the most powerful ones are shown here. Um, That's the telomere shortening at the top up up here, uh, up here, and then DNA damage. And and I wouldn't call it DNA damage, but DNA methylation uh, really is what it is. Uh, Things where things go wrong in the methylation process that we're going to talk about. Very powerful driver of aging. Uh, The one that's not up here, uh, and the reason it's not up here is that uh, scientists pretty much any place other than Russia don't have a intervention for it is what we call organ regeneration. Um, now, when I say organ regeneration, people oftentimes think of, oh yeah, the, the, you know, surgeons can replace a finger now, okay? Right. And, and those kinds of things, or can replace an ear and so forth. No, we're talking about all of the 78 human organs and systems can be regenerated. And that by itself will um, support extended lifespan, additional telomeres activation, uh, hayflick limits, and all that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about that towards the end of this presentation. So 
there's DNA methylation that we're going to talk about and at the very end, organ regeneration. Uh, this is the group that I work with in St. Petersburg. Uh, they're Russian scientists, uh, very bright, very um, smart people, very dedicated to using peptide bioregulators to both heal, cure, and extend life. Uh, this is my boss, Vladimir Kavinson, uh, former military, uh, extremely well known throughout Europe, uh, hardly known here in the United States at all. As we talked about last time, it's really sad that there's not a lot of sharing of science and medical information between Russia and America, because you know these two are great countries, very, very um, advanced in both their science and medical, and they should be sharing, but unfortunately they don't very much. Okay, we'll skip through this stuff. I thought I had blacked these out. I'm sorry they're showing up. Um, okay. So this is my boss, Professor Kavinson, uh, receiving uh, Russia's highest uh, civilian award for his 40 some odd years of service, both in the military and then after the military in private uh, uh, practice to the Russian people. And this is basically, I call him his boss, uh, basically his boss, Putin. Um, I've never, as I said, said before, I've never seen President Putin at the, um, uh, St. Petersburg Institute, but his doctor is in there all the time. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, picking up peptides okay. and so forth. Okay, uh, now, so peptides, and I'm, I'm going to define what they are in a moment, but um, they're basically, as Kavinson is saying here, they're signal molecules, okay, and they cause differentiation of cells, um, and they can be used to regenerate at the cellular level, therefore the tissue level, therefore the organ level, and we'll get into a little bit more. Uh, this is... Um, uh, Pavlov, uh, Ivan Pavlov, uh, people uh, associate him with the classical conditioning with the dogs and so forth, but his, really, his work was human digestion, human physiology. And he was sort of the beginning of, of understanding both about protein digestion that then also associated itself later with peptide digestion. Um, and this was in the early 1900s. He received the Nobel Prize for his work in 1904. So Kavinson in the military, it was the military that originally uh, launched this investigation into peptides because as I mentioned before, they were having all sorts of problems back in the 60s and the 70s, uh, starting with the Marine, the submarine uh, corps. They would send these young uh, seamen and the officers out on these three to four month uh, uh, voyages and they would come back with all sorts of medical issues because part of it was that they were sitting next to nuclear reactors that were very crudely protected at that time and so the military said look we can't have this kind of damage particularly to the immune system because these these sailors were coming back with just destroyed thymuses at this point so the uh, Soviet military threw huge amounts of money at their medical corps, their science corps, to see if they could come up with a way of regenerating uh, damaged organs and so forth. And Professor Kavinson, uh, as I showed earlier, was the lead scientist at that time in that program. And they also then expanded it to the regular military. They expanded it to, it was part of the cosmonaut program. They were using peptides uh, as the cosmonauts would come back from space. I couldn't bear to take that picture out. Sorry, Sandy. I just, I love little Nisha, uh, the space dog with that cute okay. little helmet. I love dogs. I have two of them. So we're good with that. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Yeah. Um, they used them, they use them at the uh, uh, Russian uh, Olympic uh, teams and so forth, mostly for recovery. That is, uh, they have muscle peptides and various other peptides that are appropriate for Olympic athletes, uh, you know, who are, uh, under incredible strain and stress and so forth and you know have all sorts of injuries as they're training for and competing and so they use the peptides uh, post competition typically post training uh, peptides um, there's nothing magic about peptides 
peptides are basically just tiny proteins. Um, if you take two, three, four, well, actually, if you take less than 50 amino acids, and I think I have a picture here, let me get here. Yeah, amino, if you take a, a small group of amino acids and you string them together, we call, call them peptide bonds, you string them together, eventually the, the, they interface uh, with the organs, they become proteins basically. And because they're so small, they become, uh, able to pass through the digestive system pretty intact, intact, I'm sorry. They also can pass through cell membranes because they literally are so small. We're talking about three molecules, okay? Uh, they can pass through the blood brain uh, barrier. And so they get to the targeted area and they are able to then um, bond or bind. So this is a pancreas peptide. It's uh, three amino acids long, and it shows here how it binds into the DNA, okay? And that's, it's very similar as I spoke last time. It's um, here in the US, they call it uh, armor thyroid uh, medication. Yeah. Yeah, we're, and I think the synthetic is called Synthroid, I believe. Yes, I'm on it. Okay. Without um, a thyroid. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting, it just kind of a sidebar, uh, having, dabbled with it a lot for the last 30 years with people and clients and so forth. It's interesting, some people do really well on the natural armor that's um, you know, derived from uh, pigs yes. and some people don't, but yep. they do really well on Synthroid. Yep. Uh, it's interesting how, that, how the body reacts. Yes, I Maybe have not. experience in that respect, that's for sure. <laughs> tried it all, tried it all. Okay, I'm quickly gonna go through this. The, the Russians use these peptides uh, that they formulate. By the way, back in the early days in uh, the 70s, the first peptide that they developed uh, was the thymus peptide. And the second one was the pineal gland peptide. They now have 23 of what we call the natural peptides, uh, all of them sourced from a 12 month old calves. So what they do is they take a 12 month calf, they then unfortunately uh, slaughter the, the animal, but very carefully take all of the organs and they then process, filter and process the organs each individually and create these peptides from a specific organ. And so they take, um, they have a brain peptide, for instance, that came from the brain of that calf. They have a retina peptide from the retina of the calf, a pancreas, a liver, a kidney, et cetera, et cetera. And there are 23 of these, what we call natural peptides. Um, we're only using those in the clinical studies because in Russia and accepted in the US, uh, these peptides are considered to be food supplements because they're natural based. Okay. And so we don't have any difficulty bringing them into the United States. Customs is familiar with them and so forth. There's an additional 30 some odd synthetic peptides or peptides, even the natural ones that are um, injectable, uh, lingual, uh, sublingual, et cetera, but we only use the natural peptides. So let's look at uh, retina issues. In the United States, unfortunately, and pretty much the rest of the world, if a person has a serious retina disease like retinitis pigmentosa, macular degener degeneration, there's very little that can be done. The most that can be done typically is to slow the progression a little bit, but there's yes. no yeah. Effective treatment. Okay. In Russia, they use the vision peptides as follows. This is diabetic retina retinoplasty, and I'm not going to go through each one. Where you see the green on the right, that's the after treatment. On the left is the before treatment. Where you see green, that means they have some vision there, but where you see the yellow, the red, and the black, that's impaired vision. And particularly when you get to the stage of red and black, that means basically no vision there. So this was a patient uh, treated with peptides for a couple of years. And at the end of the couple of years with another scan, we have a tremendous increase in their vision potential at this point, based on the amount of green you see here. That's so, amazing. Yes, it is truly. Here's retinitis pigmentosa. You look at the amount of black on the left compared to the right after treatment. Uh, here's macular degeneration. Uh, if you see on, on the left, there's a lot of yellow and a fair amount of black. Over on the right, I would say there's a decrease of what, at least 60, 70% of that. Um, and same thing with glaucoma, you know, tremendous uh, increase uh, after, after po post-treatment. 
And they've actually tried this one on pets as well. Like they, it works for dogs, dogs. Yeah. Oh yes. The glaucoma. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all the peptides can be used for animals. I have several veterinarians who are in the uh, clinical studies who use them for themselves, of course, but I know that they, cause they've told, talked to me about it. They use them on their animals. Okay, uh, met, let's get to the methylation study. First, okay. let's understand a little bit about methylation. Yes. In, incredibly complex. There are entire um, medical books written about methylation, okay? Um, methylation is sort of, you might call it a chemical, I, I call it a chemical factory, okay? It's a, the chemical factory that makes everything work in the body, basically. Uh, here they talk a little bit about, you know, the various, various eye health, fat metabolism, liver health, and so forth. But it's basically everything is, is impacted by methylation. And it boils down to, it's a chemical process that goes on from the moment of conception throughout a person's life. This is sort of what it looks like, okay? <laughs> Interesting put together of, of several methylated, uh, yes, combinations, carbon combinations and so forth. I just thought it was kind of interesting to see it in a complex. Um, here's a bit of a definition that will help. Um, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing. It's amazing that methylation occurs several billion times a second in our bodies. That is this chemical processing that goes on. Uh, down at the bottom, they say um, yeah, ATP energy. Uh, if the cell can't produce ATP, then there's not going to be adequate energy in the body, much like a car running out of gas. So you can think of methylation as sort of like the gas in a vehicle, but it's actually all the chemicals. Here's a, a little more uh, scientific uh, explanation of why, death, why methylation becomes problematic. It is vital for proper methylation throughout life, okay? It causes cell differentiation, it, it produces energy, it basically it's the chemical factory. What happens though, is that with time, and I'll come to that in a moment, another way to think of methylation, for those who have seen the telomere uh, presentation, I talked about telomeres are very much like tread on the tires, okay? And as, as you drive on that, those set of tires, then the tread wears down. That's exactly what happens with telomeres as you have cell replication. When you get to a point where the tire has worn down quite a bit, it becomes unsafe in order to continue driving it. There might be a blowout. It may not grip the road under icy conditions as well and so forth. Well, the same thing is true with telomeres. If telomeres get short enough, we know from many, many, I mean, literally thousands of clinical studies that the when you have shorter telomeres, there's less functionality. In other words, the cell can't replicate as quickly, which is important, mm -hmm. and B, it can't replicate perfectly. And so that's where people be, start to become vulnerable, old age, vulnerability to diseases, frailty, Alzheimer's, and all of, all of those kinds of things. So methylation kind of works in the same way um, in that the way I explain it to non-physicians is that Methylation is like, say you have a, you've got a big factory or let's say you've got a, a home uh, with a large amount of yardage and it's sort of in a marginal crime area. And so you have it well lit at night and you have a bunch of switches that automatically will light it up as, you know, as the sun sets, then the whole yard or the chemical factory outside will light up. And then as the sun comes up in the morning, the auto system uh, turns off that system and the lights go down. Well. Methylation as we age is sort of the same way in that what happens with the, the uh, chemical factory or the home is that at some point, because the system wears out or whatever, it malfunctions. And so at night when the lights are supposed to come on, they don't. Mm -hmm. And in the morning when the lights are supposed to go off, they don't, okay? In other words, it's malfunctioning. Well, that's the same thing that happens with human beings in that this methylation system, this chemical process that has to do with what we call CPG islands and so forth, this same process runs fine until it doesn't. And what was discovered at UCLA, and I'll, I'll talk about Dr. Horvath in a moment, what was okay. discovered at UCLA and other places, it's been known for a long time that as we age, the chemical system or the methylation system or the chemical factory, um, starts putting out um, 
in, incorrect chemicals, I guess is the way you could say it. And what in the genetic world, what we say is that the methylation that is supportive of a healthy aging shuts down and instead other methylation, I call it toxic methylation, starts up and it turns off genes that support aging and it starts to turn on genes that are destructive to aging, okay? Mm -hmm. So it creates this, this opposite pattern of what you want to have happen. Some scientists say that this is programmed into the human body because once you have reproduced, many scientists basically say the functionality of the human being is pretty much used up at that point. What we're supposed to do is reproduce to create you know, another generation. And so they theorize that this is a natural substance, a process that it is not a breakdown in the system that it's actually programmed into basically you know, the, the end of life and the next generation comes along. So Dr. Horvath, Stephen Horvath at UCLA, uh, the same place I went to law school, he and a group of some 60 scientists have studied this whole process for years. And what they discovered was that they could fairly accurately create a method of determining the biological age. I'm oversimplifying it, Sandy. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. They could, okay, they could, um, create a methodology to basically determine the biological age of all the major organs in the human body, okay? So the, the telomere thing that we were looking at was just looking at the end caps on telomeres. Right. Dr. Horvath's team is looking at all the major uh, organs in the body and attempting to determine what is their biological age. Um, this is sort of uh, you know, a metaphor for it. In other words, we're looking at the clocks or the biological age of all these uh, systems and organs to come up with a composite biological age based on, these, on measuring what we call methylation levels. Okay? And it turns out it's pretty accurate. Um, what they did was uh, part of the work that they did was they took s stored blood, that is people who had had blood tests uh, 20 or more years earlier and who had died. Okay. So they, so the scientists had this stored blood, you know, basically just labs that were done by people like you're going to, to lab corp or quest or so forth. Um, they had access to that stored blood. It was frozen and they knew about the various diseases that that person had experienced. They knew their date of death. And what they did was using the formulas or the logarithms that they had created, they went back and they were able to figure out basically how long, a bi we'll call it a biological age. They were able to figure out the biological age on average of the human being by looking at basically all their major organs, okay? And come up with a number. And we'll go to that in just a moment. And what they, the, their logarithms and their, their, the, the work that they had done scientifically was so accurate that they blinded the death data, ran their logarithms on the measurements that they had figured out how to take, and they could predict a person's death within two years. Holy smokes. Okay. So can, so you're telling me they took old blood samples of these individuals. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So it yes. was old, it was frozen. And then these people had since died. I, like, had I mean, since, I, right, they I, since that's died. That's just amazing. How, like, how do they well, do that? The process isn't so amazing. It's actually fairly simple, the process. Um, but the, the, the amazing part is that they were have been able to figure out basically based on Look, it's very complicated, this part of it. Basic, looking on the degree of methylation and, and what genes have, are not expressing because of the interference of the methylation, the, the toxic aspect of it, okay? Uh, looking at all of that, they can assign a biological age to this person. That is, they can say this person is 63, but looking at all of this, their average biological age is 65, okay? The, they were also able to use it to basically confirm um, a person's close to their chronological age. So for instance, it has many uses outside of the world of science. In Germany, the uh, police departments are now using it. Let's say they're on a, a crime scene. There's a bit of blood, 
but the uh, the suspect is long gone. Okay, all they have is a little bit of blood that they know belongs to a suspect. Right. They're able to take that bit of blood, run it through Dr. Horvath's you know technology and so forth, and they can predict within about two years how old this person is. So instead of having no information at all, they'll have the blood type, of course, as well. But and instead of having no information about a suspect, they can say this is a male between the ages of 24 and 26. That's who we're going to be looking for. That's how accurate it is. Now, do they, is Dr. Horvath's, because I know there's a few different ways to measure methylation, but Dr. Horvath's is known as a very accurate way, correct? Like there's a few out there. Yes, there are some um, what we would call methylation clocks or epigenetic clocks yeah. that I'll come to in a moment. There's okay. a half a dozen of them. Yeah. And like anything else in science, they build on each other. And Dr. Horvis is, I think, generally uh, accepted that his is the most accurate at the moment. And he, of course, he built on earlier work that, that was done. Right. OK, so now we get to epigenetics. Um, and we call it the epigenetic Horvath clock or just the Horvath clock. It's based on epigenetics. And what epigenetics is, you can see from this slide, people used to think that genetics basically drove pretty much everything that happened to human beings in terms of their longevity, their health and so forth. Years ago, I think 30 years ago, when, when I was really new in this field, they were talking about it being like 50% uh, of what was going to happen to a person. If you have genetic markers for say heart disease or Alzheimer's and so forth, those genes they felt at the time that would weigh 50 percent in terms of the likelihood of a person coming down with those situations mm -hmm. today it's more in the range of 10 to 15 percent it has really advanced a lot and what has grown in place of it is what we call epigenetics and epigenetics is basically all the things that happen to us during our lifetime um, the toxicities that we're exposed to, uh, literally the, the stress levels when we were young and, and that that we have occurred over life, the environment, literally the food that we put into our bodies, um, uh, how physically active, how much we exercise, all of those are called epigenetic uh, considerations. And as, as the genetic portion of our future has dropped in terms of significance. It's still there and it's still significant. Epigenetics has grown as instead. Right. Now I was gonna ask too, but the, I mean, there's some genetics that is just inevitable. Like- Yes, of course. Gene, like cert, sometimes we're just born, even, even our eye color and our, right? Like there's some things that are just inevitable. Whereas there's, you're saying epigenetics itself is now really changing this entire field, meaning that it's come up here more. We yes. know a lot more of how certain actions can affect whether we turn these genes on or off is what- Precisely. You, yeah. 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 The expression that's used is whether or not the gene expresses. Right. 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 Yeah. And yeah. what they're finding is that epigenetics, I would say epigenetics in the mind of most scientists and certainly me, um, epigenetics um, is more important than genetics, okay? That is, you can basically keep um, a genetic problematic situation from expressing, maybe, maybe. probably, if, if your epigenetic profile is excellent, okay? On the other hand, if your epigenetic profile, high stress, bad food, bad environment, et cetera, then that genetic pattern probably is going to express or has at least a, a higher possibility of expressing. I totally believe that. Okay, so what, now this is what's fascinating now, and this is, this is where I come into this. What Dr. Horvath found, and when I say Dr. Horvath, we're talking about a team of about 60 scientists working for more than five years together. What they found was that if, if your epigenetic age, okay, is eight years or more over or faster than your calendar age, what their research uh, uh, determined was that you have just doubled your risk of dying, okay? On the other hand, if your uh, epigenetic age is seven years less than your chronological or calendar age, you're protected because you have half the risk of death. OK, 
okay? And translate that into people who have a, we're seeing that people who have a epigenetic age, and we're gonna look at some slides data here in a moment. People who have an epigenetic age older than their calendar age, have led stressful lives, have had a variety of diseases, a variety of unfortunate events in their life typically that drives it. That's the epigenetics that we were talking about before. And it drives that epigenetic age to be older than your calendar age. And it's the epigenetic age that really determines uh, mortality in many ways, okay? Much more so than the calendar age. And the reverse is true. A person who has not had all of those uh, negative kinds of conditions, epigenetic conditions, uh, is aging slower basically than their calendar age. Now, let's see what that all comes down to. Okay. Oh, this was yeah. This is cancer to show you the the effect. Uh, epigenetic cancer, Rick. Um, as it shows here, for uh, this is a clinical study from Yahava. Uh, for every one year increase in the difference between the chronological and the epigenetic age a 6% increase risk of developing cancer within three years. And we go back to um, the thousands of blood um, analysis that were done, that 20 year you know, uh, stored blood and so forth. Yeah. This, the science is based on a lot of this, came out of that, okay? Um, and if you have, um, let's see here, 6% increased risk of, uh, three years and a 17% increased risk of dying of cancer in the next five years. That's crazy. Yep, it is. Uh, and it gets crazier, uh, Sandy, as you'll see in a moment. Okay, so I created a, a basically a graphic chart to kind of represent this. Um, this shows increased mortality risk. So on the X axis over here on the left, what we have is the number of years uh, older than your calendar age, okay? Mm -hmm. And it goes up, you know, two, four, six, eight, ten 10 years. On the right shows the increased uh, mortality risk as you have this disparity between your calendar and the epigenetic age. So if a person, let's say, take the four there, if uh, they are four years older than their calendar age, they have a 50% increased mortality risk compared to their same age peers whose calendar age and epigenetic age is the same. And we're going to see this in some data here in a moment. And that could be just from any of the diseases that are associated with this. Diseases, it, it, I mean, what drives it is Beyond all the things the, that we just- Those genes, yeah. Yeah, it, it can turn on, it can allow those genes to be expressed. That's one factor, but also just lifestyle. I mean, a person, you know, we don't know specifically, but the, the assumptions are, if a person, you know, basically spent their life eating in McDonald's, okay? or fast food places, they're probably going to have an epigenetic age that is above their calendar age, okay? If a person has lived in a very toxic environment, you know, next to a chemical plant or a, a nuclear power plant maybe, or just, you know, in, in a toxic area, they're probably, based on the data, because, you know, this is fairly new, so there's not a lot of data at this point, they're probably going to have an accelerated epigenetic age. On the other hand, uh, the same kind of thing on the X axis over here, the number of years below your calendar age shows a decreased mortality risk. And so we take that same four uh, here in the middle. If a person is four years below their calendar age, they have a reduced risk of 28% compared to their same age peers. Now, it's, I'm showing this as a linear kind of relationship, it's not. Okay, but this gives you sort of the idea. It's not quite as straightforward and exact as, as this by any means at all. So let's look at some, uh, a couple more things and then we're gonna get to my data. Oh uh, yeah, this is Stephen Horvath. He says, basically says, it's great we can measure your age and you're five years older. At this point, he says, I don't see a clear utility of that information because we don't have a pill or an intervention. And that is the status quo at the moment is uh, Stephen Horvath acknowledges it's, you know, we can measure it, but it kind of shrugs his shoulders and says, but so what? Because we can't do anything about it. Uh, I'm going to prove him wrong. I was just going to say there's lots. Yeah, there's here lots. we go. Yeah. Uh, the Russians published in 2015, the, they were ahead in this area like they are with telomeres. They understood all of this uh, way, way back. And they published here, you know, a published study with regard to um, 
basically you can translate that in a simple language. You can affect the epigenetic age with peptides. That's really what it's, it's is translates as is as peptidogenetic regulation of gene expression. It's a fancy word for saying you can use peptides to affect your epigenetic age. So I uh, started talking to Professor Cavinson years ago, four or five years ago. First, the telomere study, and then uh, once we got approval for the telomere study, and we were several years into it, about two years ago, a little over two years ago. COVID kind of slowed it down for us, but two years ago, uh, he approved a methylation study. And the goal of this is to determine if we can use the peptide bioregulators that we talked about it in the first uh, uh, video with regard to lengthening telomeres, can we also change people's epigenetic age? In other words, can we take a person who has an older epigenetic age than their calendar and can we reverse that? Can we make them younger epigenetically and modify the epigenetic damage that maybe has been happening, you know, over the years? Mm -hmm. So the baseline, before we started the study, uh, as we were getting ready, <clears throat> I had people who had been in the telomere study for several years at that point, including myself. So what we did, uh, there's two labs in the U.S. that test uh, for DNA methylation age, you might say. Um, and so we used one of the labs and we tested nine subjects who had been on the peptides, okay, for at least two years or more. Some of them like myself had been on them for like four years at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and their DNA age came back 5.42 years less than their chronological. Zero is chronological up here, okay? Yeah. So this group of nine people who had been on peptides came back with a five, almost a half, five and a half year less epigenetic age than their chronological age, okay? In other words, they had decreased um, risk literally of death at this point by, if there were five years less, their decrease would be about uh, 40 some odd percent compared to their peers. And we're gonna look at that chart again. Then I, at the same time, I took 19, or no, I'm sorry, 15 people who had not been on any peptides who were being recruited into this new study. And we tested their baseline average DNA age or epigenetic age. They came back on the average two years older than their chronological age, okay? This is not proof, this is not evidence. This is what we call proof, proof of concept, okay? It's a suggestion that maybe it's worth doing some further uh, research and um, run a clinical study to show that peptides can have a favorable impact. If these numbers had come back, Sandy, where there was no difference between the peptide group and this, we wouldn't be having this conversation today because exactly. we wouldn't have gone forward. Yeah. Okay, now I just clicked ahead a little bit. Let me get back. Okay, so with this proof of concept that peptides can intervene in the epigenetic age, we then started the study and let's see. Uh, oh, this is me. This is my baseline test. Uh, I showed you my baseline tests in the telomeres. And of course we always start with the, the scientists experimenting on himself. Yeah. So. Uh, I was 72 when we, uh, yeah, two years ago, when we um, did my baseline, I had been on the peptides for four some odd years at that point. My DNA age, as we call it, or is it what this lab uh, calls it, uh, came back at 64. That's eight years less than my chronological, okay? So what does that mean in terms of risk profile? I'm off the charts, okay? At seven years, I have a 50% reduced uh, mortality risk compared to my peers. And Dr. Horvath's research didn't go beyond seven years, so we don't know at eight years. But basically, my mortality risk is about half of that of a 74-year-old male in this country. That's now, amazing. Let's go, uh, I'm sorry? I said, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is, but the, but it's real science. I mean, this is yeah. this is not theoretical. This is real stuff. So uh, this is the opposite extreme. This is a friend of mine. He's uh, a London health professional. Um, his baseline 
Um, he was 57 uh, when we did the baseline. He'd not been on peptides and he came back at 72. That's 15 years older yeah. than his calendar age. Right. Let's, let's go to the graph. He's off the graph, okay? At eight years, he has a 100%, in other words, his, his increased mortality risk is double that of a person standing next to him of the same chronological age. But his was 15 years. So he's got an almost 200% increased risk of death compared to a, a same age peer. He was not pleased. No, I guess not. And he's doing something about it. He's in the study. Oh, that, that's good. That's good. Okay. So, so let's look at some data. Now, this, this data is just now coming in. COVID really set us back quite a bit for a lot of reasons. Um, we're just now getting the secondary tests in. And what we're discovering is that it um, takes longer to reverse DNA age than it does telomere age. And I think I know the reason why. Um, I think the reason why is that there are 78 human organs and systems and the DNA age formula, the, the Horvath technology is basically based on methylation changes is basically uh, gauging a biological age of most of those major organs. So there's a lot more that has to happen when you've got 78 organs than when you're just dealing with, and I shouldn't say just, I mean, telomeres are incredibly important, but when you're dealing with the same issue that is telomere length on the end of chromosomes. So this is a person um, whose chronological age and DNA age was 53, okay, the same. And that means that she has the normal, that's why her percentile is about 45%. She has basically the normal mortality risk of, of a female, you know, roughly her age, just slightly less than, than others. Okay, now let's go a year and a half, 18 months later, the same person. We put her on the peptide program. She's now 54 instead of 53, and her DNA age now has dropped to 52. So she's now three years younger than her chronological age DNA wise. And we go to Horvath's information. At three years less, she's now 21% less mortality risk than she was 18 months earlier. So instead of being at the same mortality risk, you know, a normal human being at her age and so forth, she now has an improved mortality risk of less, uh, you know, uh, decreased mortality risk of 21%. So she's got an improvement compared to her peers. Yeah, okay. you see from these too that the, the needle definitely moves a lot slower with yes. this study. You know, yes. whereas in the other study that we were talking about, you might see like 18 years, right? With the telomere study. I know that on some examples, it was quite significant, whereas this is just a couple of years, right? Yes, but... Okay, and this is very important. Okay, you can't compare the two at all, and people okay. fall into this fall into this trap. They go, they say to me, "Well, Bill, you know my telomere. You know I'm 15 years younger telomere wise, and it only took 12 months." Or right. that would be okay. On the other hand, we only got a two year improvement in in my DNA. Well, we're measuring different things, and what they have to understand is we go back to we go to the, uh, let me go back. We go to these charts. What we're talking about here, that one. If a person is two years older, let's look at the number two. Okay, if they're two years older than their calendar age, they have a 25% increased risk of death. We're moving that needle from 25% increased risk to 28% less risk. Yes. I mean, that is incredible. That is, uh, I won't say it's more important than telomere because it's, it's sort of like saying the tires are more important than the engine. You know, you, you need them both. Yes. But yeah, people have that same kind of reaction. Well, Bill, I, I, I'm not so impressed that I only changed by two years. It isn't the years that's important. It's the mortality risk factor. It's and the if percentage. someone, yeah, yeah, 
and if Sandy, if someone came to you and said, you know, you take these, you you enter you intervene with this protocol of peptides for say 18 months or two years, and it will change your mortality risk. Uh, it will decrease your mortality risk by 28%. I mean, there ain't nothing out there in the world that comes close to that. Exactly. Okay, so let's go on. Okay, that was the lady with the same same. Um, and what's interesting about this is <clears throat> we, we call it the gap, the gap, G-A-P. People get concerned because, well, maybe their DNA age hasn't changed too much, maybe by one year, but they're two years older. And they'll say, well, but I was 52 two years ago, DNA wise, and I'm only 51 now. That's not much of a change. Yeah, but you're two years older. Right. And what, Hor what yeah, and what Horvath found was it didn't matter what age, it's the gap that counts. It's the number of years different between your DNA age and your chronological that counts. And so if an 85 year old person <clears throat> has a gap of two years or a 32 year old person has a gap of two years, they have the same risk of mortality, okay? Now the 32 year old will live longer, okay? But their mortality risk all through life is going to be at least that 32 and will probably increase over the years. Mm -hmm. So it isn't that we're going to reduce the DNA age so much, what we're gonna do is create that gap. And our goal in these studies is get to, get everybody to have a DNA age at least five and preferably seven years less than their calendar age because at that point, they're in the sweet spot. They're in that 50% or 40% reduced risk. Okay. Okay, this is another uh, lab test. Uh, this is also a physician. Um, July of 19, he was one of the earliest uh, coming in. And his uh, chronological age was 53. His DNA age was 55, two years older than his uh, DNA, I'm sorry, than his chronological. So based on that, he's got about a 25% increased mortality risk at this point, okay? And what we are seeing is that, because the study continues on, what I'm seeing is that um, if we can, for instance, hold the DNA age constant, even though another year goes by or two years, what we do is we pick up decreased mortality risk. Because if we go back to, well, I'll come back to that in a moment. It's gonna get confusing. Okay, so we put him on the peptide program, okay, and about two years later, 18 months later, he is now 55 chronologically, but his DNA age has dropped to 51, okay? So now he's four years younger, or I, I shouldn't say it. That's, that's not a right, uh, proper term. He has four years less mortality risk, okay? Yeah. And what that shows on our chart here is at four years, well, let me actually go back. Where, when he was two years, when he was two years over his chronological age, he had an increased mortality risk of 25%. Right. Okay. He's vulnerable at that point. So he goes on the peptide program. We now have a four year gap between the two. And notice that over here, in terms of the population, it's hard to see, but at his baseline, he's in the 16th percentile compared to his same age peers. Okay. And over here, he's moved up to the 86th percentile. I mean, huge increase huge. compared to his peers. And the, again, the most important thing is being four years less than his chronological. We come over here, he's got a 28% decreased mortality risk. So instead of a 25% increased mortality risk through his, through his lifetime, yeah. he's more protected. He's got a 28% decreased. So when Hor Dr. Horvath, you know, I have great respect for him. He's, he's a brilliant, brilliant individual, born in, he's a uh, German, uh, born in Germany and so forth, been here in the United States a long time, a wonderful man. Um, he's just not aware, just like the, the telomere scientific community pretty much around the world aren't aware that there are interventions 
that the Russians have figured out that can change these numbers, can change and relengthen telomeres, can change the DNA uh, um, uh, mortality risk. Okay, so now that's pretty much the DNA methylation. Here's the last piece of this. There are really three studies, the telomere study, but it's a confirmation study. I, I already know what the outcome of that's going to be. I knew on day one because the Russians had already done that you know, years ago. The DNA methylation study, they'd never done the study uh, as such. They had a lot of theory and so forth. It's the first study that I'm aware of that actually um, has been able to move the needle. So that is a true clinical study, okay? The third is a, a bunch of clinical studies I know the outcome because they were done also a long time ago. And this is what we call organ regeneration. So before I jump to that, um, Smithsonian Magazine just printed an article based on a clinical study where they're indicating that the human potential lifespan could be 150 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to come back to this in a moment. Okay. Okay. Now, so we call it the peptide longevity program. It's, it's the umbrella program for these clinical studies. Um, and the goal is enhance lifespan and reduce mortality using the peptide virus. So here's the scientific data, because it's always the data. Mm -hmm. So before I get to, quite to the data, this is the aging expectation that we talked about earlier, okay? This is the aging expectation that Dr. Cavinson and I have and expect to be able to share with as many people as we can. Um, here is the published clinical study for the data I'm gonna show you in a few moments. It was published in 2002. And so the Russians have known for that long how to extend life by reducing mortality. And the DNA methylation and the peptides basically operate on all of these uh, organs that you see here, as well as many others. Okay, as I said earlier, there's 78 of them. What the program does is it goes in at the cellular level using these peptides and it regenerates at the cellular level, then the tissue, then the entire organ all of these major organs. And so at the end of a certain period of time that we're gonna talk about in a moment, a person basically walks out with, I don't know if the word is remodeled or, um, I can't think of the word. If you, if, you, if you took your car in and said, go in and, and change out everything that needs to be changed out so that it's a brand new uh, running you know, vehicle and so forth. What is it? That's a good word. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Thank you, yeah. Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> what you have here is in a sense, not totally because, you know, we can't change the outward appearance of the person and so forth, but we can refurbish. Okay. We can refurbish all of their important organs. Yeah. Now let's see. Lawrence is saying we can do this. Let's look at the data. Okay. Here comes the proof. The attorney part of me says, yeah. Okay. Show me the evidence. Okay. Yeah. Here's the evidence. I mentioned this in the telomere study just briefly, I think I did, but this is too important to, to not re revisit. What the Russians did was they did a whole bunch of studies. These are just a couple of them. They took a group of people called elderly people. Uh, the age bracket was 60 to 74 years of age. And they had a control group, which was the non-peptide group. Uh, people just taking what they call polyvitamins, you know, no peptides here, okay? And let's just skip down. Um, they, they did a review uh, data collection at eight years, but let's go down to the, to the 12 year study altogether, okay? It just continued on. In that period of time, what they were looking at, the, the, the end point was mortality, okay? In other words, how many people died, okay? Um, and in this study of 60 to 74 year old people over 12 years, 44% of these people died. As I think I said earlier in the in the other podcast, that may seem high, but these are Russians and Ukrainian people, and they don't have the best lifestyle, and they actually have less longevity than most of the rest of the world. Although the Americans are catching up to them, unfortunately. Do you know that in the last two years we've had a decrease in the average um, 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 
length of life of, a, of the typical American life expectancy. It's decreased for the first time in our history. Really? And not just because of COVID, it got, it got accelerated a little bit by COVID, but it was already in that direction before COVID. Anyway, yeah, it has to do with diabetes and, and obesity and those things. So 44% mm -hmm. of these people die. Here's the peptide group with one single peptide, okay? Just one peptide, the pineal gland peptide. And remember we have 23 now, okay? Yes. The mortality rate was dropped in half over that 12 years. In other words, people on the peptides had half the death rate or mortality rate than the people not on a peptide. Cut it in half. The way that this happened was through organ regeneration, particularly you know, with the pineal because it's like the master gland you know, peptide and so forth. So then in another study, they, they had an older group. As I said to you uh, recently, the, the Russians are not considered great diplomats. Uh, they called these people old people, okay? You're almost we, there. You're almost there, aren't you? Uh, thanks for the reminder. <laughs> Yes. Oh no. oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. It. You don't act it. So look at you. I mean, you would never think that. So. Okay. Let's get back to this. Oh, come on. <laughs> here, wait a minute. I'll fix it up here. Okay. Okay. Um, so me and my fellow old people, <laughs> I'll be in two months. I'll be 75. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in that group of people, it was a six year study, of course, because you know the age of the people and so forth. So in the control group here, okay, almost 82% of these people died, 81.8. Okay. Yeah. Again, using just the pineal peptide, okay, it dropped it to 40, 46%, 45.8%. I mean, doggone, oh, I gotta stop holding it down. Okay. Um, I get overly excited about this stuff yeah. um, because it applies to me as well and uh, all my loved ones and Peanut, our little puggle dog and so forth uh, on peptides. Peanut, the peptide dog. There you okay, go. so 45% so, um, um, on the one peptide reduction from 82. Then they had added for the six years, they added a second peptide, and that's the thymus or immune peptide, immune system peptide. They dropped the, uh, those people that were taking the two peptides, their mortality rate dropped to 33%. So from 82% to 33% in this old people category, th that was the incredible reduction in mortality. And the reason that it happened was they got telomere lengthening, they also, without knowing it at the time, got DNA methylation modification, but most importantly, they got organ regeneration. That's what the peptides were doing, just with those two peptides. So the exciting thing about it is that today, we have 23 of these peptides. And in the clinical studies, we're using most of those for most people. I would say the average person is probably using over a course of a year, they're using at least 19 or 20 of the various peptides because there's peptides, you know, for the heart, for the liver, kidney, pancreas, mm -hmm. the retina, muscles, uh, 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 cartilage renewal, and so forth. Now, here's the, the really amazing part of this. In, let's go back up here. In this group, Oh, there it is, okay. In this group here, the elderly people, that uh, study went on for 12 years. They only used the peptides for the first three years. And so it can, they, they weren't on a maintenance after the three years? No maintenance. They regenerated in three years time, they oh, regenerated wow. the important systems, organs and so forth. And then there were no peptides given for the next nine years at all. That's unreal. Isn't it? Yeah. That is. No maintenance. So okay. So basically they, these peptides help them to tap into their own biological reserve. Yes, it did. Absolutely. Good, good wording. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. What, what was the word you, you I, I was using remodeling. You refurbished. said. Refurbished. Okay. Refurbished. So, yeah. So you go refurbish your car. You don't have to refurbish it every year. 
True. You You're, do some maintenance. You, yes. If you get a new MacBook, you can get a refurbished MacBook and it'll last you quite a while, right? That's right. That's right. The same theory here. So they only use the peptides. They were curious. They wanted to know if they use the peptides at the beginning, what would happen in this case, nine years later for the, the group in the 12 year uh, uh, group down here. So three years on and just on two peptides, nine years off. And then they did the, the evaluation of how many people died and they got these numbers. Okay. And on the older group, the, the 75 to 89 um, here, they use the peptides for the first two years only. Wow, that's pretty good. So the warranty lasts pretty long. It will last a long time. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like and so the people that are in the clinical studies, we, we ask them, you know, it's not mandatory, but we ask them uh, voluntarily if they will commit to staying in three years. And then it's up to them if they want to do some kind of minor maintenance after that, that's fine. We'll, we'll continue to provide them with the peptides, but they could walk away at that point and they ought to be able to get a bunch of years. And we don't know because the Russians didn't continue the, you know, you know, stop it for nine years and then start again. So we yeah. don't know how long the warranty is, you might say. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When does that expire? That's still- We don't know exactly, no, but now right? let, me, let me go to something that has almost nothing to do directly with this, okay? Okay. This is a guy by the name of Irv Gordon, okay? He drove this Volvo, I think it was, uh, he, it was a 1966 Volvo. You may have heard about him. He has the Guinness World Record for driving the same car, the no largest number of miles, 3.2 million miles, he drove this 1966 Volvo. Okay. And the point here is he maintained it meticulously. Oh, but wow. take a look at him though. Mm. Yeah, he's not looking so maintained, is he? I think he spent too much time driving his uh, Volvo around because he died last year at age 77. Uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah, the message is maintain yourself, okay? So we're coming to the end of this. Um, I, we talked about this before, the bridge concept. Um, and what we're talking about here is that there are things like these peptide bioregulators are been around for a long time in Russia, but they're being introduced through these clinical studies here in America. That's just one of many interventions I think for my own journey, uh, the reason I'm involved with them is that they have, for me, the huge, the, a large amount of leverage. In other words, for what I have to do, take some you know, capsules and so forth and so forth, do some testing every year to get the kind of results that we're seeing here on the data. Um, it's it's the, the primary thing that I would do to get longevity and health span. But there are other things, you know, I'm also doing uh, stem cells and, uh, uh, just a, a half a dozen things uh, besides uh, um, uh, the telomeres and the peptides and so forth. The point is this, is that there are things that you can do now of which many I'm doing, okay? Um, there are things on the drawing board that are available soon. The, the Israelis 18 months ago came out, a, a, um, a company came out with clinical data showing that they had some substances taken in pill form that in three weeks time basically stopped every form of cancer that they were able to test. Really? Yeah. It, it'll never, it won't make it to America forever, but it will probably be available through their FDA equivalent in another two years. And so people will fly to Israel, spend three weeks taking these substances basically um, and stop the cancer and reverse it, okay? Wow. Uh, there's too much money invested in cancer treatment in America for them to allow that to occur over here, unfortunately. But the point is this, is that there are, are amazing things that are on the drawing boards that I talk to other scientists almost weekly about that, that are, are you know, on the cusp of becoming available. Diabetes is going to be controllable here uh, very soon. Uh, 
heart disease, same thing. Um, you know, all the major diseases, cancer, cancer will be in other countries will be both controlled and, and reversed uh, in other countries very soon. But you've got to stay healthy for the next 10 years in order to take advantage of these things. Um, if you can stay healthy and get to the other end of this bridge, you will have the benefit of all of the technology that's being developed right now and some of which is available like the peptide bioregulators. So with that, I think I've given you all the information I can with regard to the DNA methylation study and the organ regeneration study. I love this stuff. I actually, you know, I, I find this side of it, the two studies are both very, very important, but the methylation side of it, I find a lot more exciting. It's a lot more interesting to me personally, let's just say, but I understand why both are very important. Now, here's a question for you. These individuals who are in the clinical study, what are their lifestyle habits or does that not even apply? Oh, no, it, it applies. I, I can't measure the impact on these uh, biomarkers that we're looking at, you know, the telomeres, and, because I can't do a, an exhaustive profile of each person's lifestyle and compare them to others in the study. Right. Um, these are basically, they are healthy people uh, because... There, most of them now are health professionals. We only admit uh, health professionals into the clinical studies right? Um, with a few exceptions. Um, if they have any serious disease, we will not, if, if, if they have active cancer, we will not admit them into the clinical study. Not because we think that the peptides would be harmful. They wouldn't, in fact, they would be helpful. Yes. Um, but the problem is if, if the cancer gets worse and they die, um, then the conventional physicians are going to look for a scapegoat. Oh, you're on these pills from Russia. Oh my yeah. goodness. Oh yeah. You don't want that. No. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but to answer your question, um, I can't, I can't measure, but the people that I deal with on a daily basis are really healthy, but that, but they were healthy at least the last two years, you know, as I said to you before, Five years ago, when I was starting the telomere study, if you had a pulse, I was asking you to join the study. Right. Okay. Um, now, though, because we restrict it to health professionals, and the health professionals are not your overweight conventional physician who is telling you what to do but doesn't do it themselves. Okay. Right. These are alternative, holistic people who are really uh, uh, targeting health. They're healthy, and and we do. Uh, with a number of the physicians, they use the peptides for their patients and I get feedback. I see their labs. I get the feedbacks from the doctors. Um, a person has a kidney problem. Uh, six months later, the kidney problem is resolved. And I need to kind of stay away from that whole thing, but you know. yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. This is all just information just from the clinical study. So there's uh -huh. no medical advice given here. It is simply information being passed on. Yes. Um, but then, it, you know, even if you go back to the studies, let's say that Russia did on, uh, you talked about it, is it M, M prom, the gas, uh, employee gas prom, gas yep. prom that's it. Um, you know, it's not like they were saying, okay, are you a smoker? Are you not a smoker? Are you right? Like everybody saw that needle move who were on the peptides, but maybe lifestyle comes into play with how well they're going to work depending on what you're doing, correct? Yeah, this, this is not a cure-all by any means at all. What this does is it makes you, the peptides will make you much healthier. And so the gas prom studies that we looked at in the telomere section, what they had was about a 2.6 and 2.8 reduction in um, sickness based on people showing up for work. In other words, the number of days that people were uh, missing work. So they had a control group, not on the peptides, then they had a control group or a peptide group. And what they figured out or what the data showed was that there was a 2.7 times reduction in missed days by the, for, due to respiratory diseases based on using the peptides. And I think overall, uh, overall sickness was 2.8 or 2.9 times reduced. So basically it's protecting people. What it's really doing, Sandy, is it's taking those organs, particularly the thymus and the pineal gland, and 
regenerating them um, such that they become much more effective at warding off disease. Right, right. Um, okay, I have a couple of other questions and then we've already gone to over an hour. I get the feeling that stress seems to be a pretty huge factor. So, you know, not everyone, and I always like to make this applicable to anybody, not everyone can go into a clinical study. Not everyone can take peptides. However, it seems that stress seems to be the big factor, which can really affect your overall health and wellness. Would you agree with that? Uh, sort of. I, the reason I say sort of, I think there's two things that it would be hard to tease out which is more okay. impactful. And the two things are stress and diet. Okay. Yeah. Like now, we know, as I, as I mentioned in the uh, telomere study, um, the studies that were done by Elizabeth Blackburn uh, out of UC San Francisco, who one of the re recipients of the Nobel Prize in 2009, that pregnant women who had a stressful pregnancy give birth to newborns with significantly shorter telomeres to go through life with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's how impactful it is. Unbelievable. And then uh, individuals that would say go on, you know, like peptides or whatever, if like, I'm just trying to think even the individuals who are in your clinical studies, they technically really wouldn't need to take supplements, right? Because if they're doing both studies and they're doing all of the protocols, then why would they need to take other supplements? Would that, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But here, here's the reason why they probably would want to continue with okay. many of their supplements. All right. If, if our foods were real food, you know, like we had, like our grandparents had, okay, not the, you know, pesticides and the glyphosate and, and, you know, and, you know, the, the meats that are done, you know, in these factories and all that and the hormones and so forth, then I would say, yeah, sure. You know, they can get their vitamins that they need, the necessary ones basically from food. Uh, because that's not the case, certainly here in the U S I would say, yes, you, I still take a number of what we call nutraceuticals. Okay. Yes. All yeah. right. That's great advice. Is there anything else that you'd like to add Dr. Lawrence? Um, I, I think people should not get the idea that a peptide protocol or program is all they need to do. They need to do all the things that we, that reasonable people that you do, that I do. Uh, we touched on this, I think in our, in our first podcast, mm -hmm. they need to exercise. Um, you know, they need to avoid, you know, con as far as I'm concerned, conventional doctors. And, and, and let me clarify that. I, it's not that I'm down on conventional doctors. The, the poor doctors, every doctor I've ever known really means well for his or her patients. They really, really do. But the lawyer side of me knows that they are in a very restrictive box yes. called conventional medical standard care, standard of care. Okay. And they are aware of things outside of that conventional standard of care that would be helpful for their patients. But because the medical world and medical associations haven't put their stamp of approval on it, they can't use it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I feel for them. But unfortunately, because of the, um, oh, what would I call it? Because of the, of the straight jacket that they're in, in a sense, I can't have, advise any person other than in maybe the orthopedic field. Okay. I can't advise any person to go to a conventional doctor for anything. They need to seek out an alternative, holistic and integrative, whatever the term of the day is, because they have, they don't have the, the straight jacket on. They have access to so many other therapeutic interventions, nutraceuticals, uh, chelation, uh, you know, you name it. Um, so my advice would be don't rely, certainly at least get a second opinion from a non-conventional doctor. And another thing is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, people need to turn, tune off, turn out, tune off the conventional media, especially when it comes to anything about disease. I'll agree with that. I've yep. been tuning out the uh, mass media in the last year and a bit for, <laughs> I'm getting pretty good at it. That's for sure. Good. 
because that will also reduce your stress level. I, I can tell you that the I mass agree. media has just greatly enhanced the stress level of everyone around the globe unnecessarily. Yes. So. All right. Well, thank you so much once again mm -hmm. for coming, Dr. Lawrence. Doctor, I call you Dr. Bill, Dr. Lawrence, <laughs> but I really appreciate your time. It's been my pleasure. I appreciate it. And you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Sandy. Okay, I stopped the uh, recording on the audio. I love mm -hmm. that one. I thought that was lovely. I think it was Good. very informative. And 